Good morning. Afternoon. Good afternoon. A little late today. A little bit late. Okay, Facebook is telling me I'm live, so that's amazing. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Instagram. Gosh, Facebook, I'm so sorry. Look at how, hi Karen, look at how poor my lighting is. Let's see if I can make it slightly better. Well, Facebook, poor lighting it is. What are you going to do? Instagram, you've got great lighting because for whatever reason, the camera is so much better. Wait, let's see if I can make it a little better. Mm, still not great, huh? Okay, it's a little better. Ah. <laughs> Never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> How much better an iPad is than a laptop sometimes for these things. It's fine. Hey, good afternoon, good afternoon. Woo, here we are. My name is Dr. Shannon Coates and I am coming to you live from north of Toronto in the uh, traditional lands of the, give me five seconds to just pull up my thing, uh, here on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeweke, the Mississauga and the Wendake Neowentseo peoples. And, um, there we go, yeah, okay, coming back, there we go. And my pronouns just, for good measure, are she, they. So I am um, <laughs> just back, I get, got back yesterday, from the National Association of Teachers of Singing Conference, National Conference in Chicago. Uh, it was, uh, wow, been a thing. It was, uh, I, I went over, um, I think I was there a day early, so I was over there on the 30th, and then um, came back a day later, so, you know, gone for a week or so, give or take. So first time traveling, obviously, since before COVID, and so that was all very interesting, wearing masks in the airport and the airplane and all that stuff, all good. And uh, very interesting to um, you just, I mean, it was really something. Any of you who were there too, it was really something just to be in person with real people and to hug faces and to, uh, you know, to talk and to be able to just be in space with people. It was uh, really fantastic. So really fantastic experience to be able to do that. I know there are some folks who have contracted COVID um, because of being around all those people. I think there was uh, an inevitability to that. Um, I think that that we all sort of do our best to mitigate the risk. And of course, you know, depending on what you might have coming after the conference, you know, mitigate that risk. And then if whatever you can do, if you weren't able to mitigate enough, then, um, you know, take on the risk of getting that. So, so far, so good for me. However, I did have COVID quite recently and everything I'm reading says that I was, that we're likely, um, you know, likely, likely still immune. Fingers crossed. All right. So I, I wanted to just, oh, hi, Gabby. Um, I wanted to just, um, I wanted to, to kind of say a couple of the things that I found myself saying quite a bit at the booth. So I had a booth there, I was with the Speakeasy Cooperative, and had a booth there uh, within the Speakeasy Cooperative booth, um, and there were a whole bunch of us there, and then across the road, across the road from us in the Exhibitor Hall, there was... Um, uh, some other Speakeasy Cooperative members, uh, Liz Jackson Hearns was there with the Voice Lab, um, uh, and Liz Jackson, Liz's uh, co-partner Alexandra, um, as well as co-founder, excuse me, Alexandra, hi! <laughs> Gabby and I have seen each other like every day for the past week, and it feels weird to not see you today. Gabby, I'm so sorry. <laughs> And um, actually, we, we've been also, we were kind of like getting together for a couple of days before that too. So yeah. And um, oh yes, and Nikki Loney was across the way from us. So there was a lovely sort of like we were in the booth together. And uh, the folks who were sort of in my little part of the booth were Jess Baldwin from True Colors Artistry. I think I don't have the name correct, but I will tag Jess. So then you'll get the name if you would like as well as Angela Winter, who does sort of like heart-centered, heart-forward website design, um, pretty spectacular stuff. 
And then Gabby was in, Gabriela Farias was also in the booth with me, um, uh, helping to talk about the VPA, the Voice Pad Un degree, and um, uh, you know, the Vocal Instrument 101. So lots of questions just from being in the booth. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the questions around. Um, <laughs> I know, I ah, can't see him today. Um, uh, so lots of questions that I wanted to just kind of, I wanted to just say a few things about some of the things that people were saying. First of all, it was so gratifying to meet so many of you in person and, you know, folks who are like, folks coming up saying, I, you know, I watch your stuff and I love your stuff and I'm really glad you're out there saying what you say and doing what you do. And, you know, so that is really, that was very gratifying and validating to have so many people coming through and also to have a whole bunch of people whose names I did not recognize who don't necessarily, you know, long, what is it, long time listener, first time caller? Yeah, so a lot of people who are just kind of watching and who don't necessarily comment or like, but who are definitely there. And so uh, if you were one of those folks, it was just a real pleasure to meet you and I'm really glad that you came and said something. Um, and also it was just, it was terrific to meet so many people who I've worked with and who, you know, who I know from online and anyway, that was all terrific. So some of the questions, one of the big questions, interestingly, uh, one of the big questions that came up uh, quite a bit actually was um, knowing folks who are, who know Nats, the National Association of Teachers of Singing, and who have a relatively, um, you know, who, who, who understand the organization to be uh, fairly academic teacher oriented and fairly Western art music oriented or Western classical music oriented, um, which may or may not be true. I mean, I, I think that is a true perception, but I'm just saying who have the perception of that uh, about the organization and then who you know know who I am and what I do which is you know sort of working primarily with independent voice teachers and talking about how Western classical lens can affect our work with the in the independent voice teacher studio etc cetera, etc cetera. so knowing that there there were tons of folks you know asking so why are you in Nats? Like, what is that? What is it for you? Like, what is that for you and why and all that stuff? Which I thought was a really perceptive question and something that I was, I wanted to just kind of get out there. So there are a couple of reasons why I, um, you know, why I'm in Nats and why I participate and, and try to do, uh, you know, try to work within Nats um, and have the connection with Nats. And um, one of those reasons is to be that you know to be that guy in the in the organization and there are other of course independent voice teachers in the organization but one of the reasons that i'm in the organization is to be that guy in the organization saying hey independent voice teachers independent voice teachers let's not forget the needs of independent voice teachers let's make sure we're still thinking about what happens with independent voice teachers so that's one of the reasons that i'm in that in the organization um Another reason is that there are lots and lots of voice teachers in that organization. In fact, the vast majority of people in the organization are voice teachers, and I primarily work with voice teachers. So uh, there's a, it is a target-rich environment, if you will, for me in terms of folks who I want to be able to work with and talk to and have the chance to talk to and, and connect with. So that is one thing. And the reason I go to the conferences, and I've been to a couple so far, and I've gone to the international conferences a couple of times as well, the International Congress of Voice Teachers. One of the reasons I do that is because I love presenting. So I do love to like get get stuff out there and be able to you know say, hey, here's something to think about. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And one of the reasons that I do that is uh, to go is because I love being with all the people. <laughs> So those conferences are terrific ways for me to, to kind of be in my flow and just meet all the people and really, you know, enjoy getting to know people and, and making connections. So that's terrific. And the presentation that, um, you know, that I was involved with this year at this conference uh, that I did with co two co-presenters, Gabriela Farias uh, and Sarah Campbell, the Canadian Sarah Campbell. Um, the presentation that we put together was... Um, uh, uh, Sarah, terrific. Oh, that's so, I'm so, thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
yep, that is one of the main reasons that I'm there is just to keep like that, just that reminder, just keep that reminder. Um, let me come back to the presentation in a minute actually, because not only to keep that reminder going, but to also continue to advocate for ways to include underrepresented voices in big organizations like this. The organization itself is set up such that the folks who are able to do and offer and be engaged and sit on committees and you know, write for the Journal of Singing and do all of the, you know, do all of the work that it takes to keep an organization like this going and relevant. The folks who are able to do that in general tend to be folks who are supported by an institutional salary, right? So, um, you know, if you're supported by an institutional salary, say if you're going for tenure, then being on a committee or being the head of XYZ, um, all of this sort of volunteer work, even if it does come with a stipend or a travel or you know, even if it does come with some support that way, it is essentially volunteer work, right? So all of this work then can go toward a tenure, you know, can go toward a tenure package. Um, and if you are a tenured prop or a full-time, uh, you know, teacher, then it can also go toward, you know, if I'm doing, I'm doing service to my community, to my association, and so then when I do this amount of service, then I, can, I you know, the, the, the administration will take some of my um, responsibilities off of my plate in the actual, in the school. So I may be able to teach fewer applied lessons and still have the same salary or I may be able to teach one fewer class one less class and still have the same salary or I may be able to participate in fewer um, committees or volunteer volunteer positions in the administration of the institution and still have the same salary so uh, there's there is um, you know the support from the institution and also, you know, if I'm going to a conference, I, I may have support from the institution in terms of paying for the, um, you know, the conference fee or even travel expenses, etc. Because I'm because I am representing the institution at the conference. So all of that support uh, means that it's easier in some cases, in many cases, it is easier um, for a, uh, uh, you know, someone who is supported by an institutional salary to be able to be fully engaged and to have, you know, to be able to really uh, contribute in the, in an organization such as NATS. And the same just isn't true for the majority of independent voice teachers because, you know, like my, my clients, like the parents of my 10 year old students, they couldn't give a rip <laughs> whether or not, like, they're not gonna, like, <laughs> they don't care. I mean, yes, they think it's impressive that I present at, you know, that I'm presenting at a conference, or they th think it's wonderful that I'm the president of the, you know, I'm the president of the local chapter or whatever, like, they think that's cool, but they don't, like, they're not gonna, you know, <laughs> if I don't teach the kid, they're not gonna give me a break and still pay me, you know? <laughs> I still need to teach their kid and I still need to put in those hours. So I don't have as an independent voice teacher in order to be engaged and to really contribute in these organizations, it takes, it's a different kind of work, right? So I'm there, I'm, I'm, all, I'm there in the organization just continually reminding and saying, hey, you know, this is, uh, you know, this organization has so much to offer. The, the, there's a large part of the membership, I don't know what the numbers are, but there are a large part of the membership who are not supported by an institutional salary. And so how can we ensure that it's not uh, a sacrifice monetarily to have, um, to have oh yeah Ian, Ian is coming in you're absolutely right Ian as well there is also the other side of academic institution I'm just saying that there is there is no support whatsoever from from my salary you know from what I'm doing 
in the institution uh, to, to be engaged in the in the organization whereas for an academic teacher it is set up there is a little bit there can be so Ian let me just make sure I get that the full comment there uh, for what it's worth most academic teachers under 50 have little to no institutional support it's all out of our pockets even research release isn't a real thing anymore wow it is a pretty brutal environment uh, pretty brutal to be in an environment where you're expected to provide service but are not compensated for it it's really thin air that has access to it wow so Ian, that is uh, heartbreaking and also not terrific. So maybe that actually still goes to my point though, eh? Because the folks who have traditionally been able to engage in the way that, that organizations like Nats need to be engaged with are actually, you know, like that sort of, the folks who got into academia you know, 25 years ago or however long ago. So that is also, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm I'm here in in Nats and in organizations such as Nats to and, and just continually saying, hey, this old model that we've got here and all of this wonderful engagement and uh, that we have had and that we've benefit, benefit fr benefited from, yeah, that we've benefited from for such a long time and that this institution was founded on, right? So all, all, the whole model of the way this institution works, the way that Nats works, is founded on and with the expectation that folks are going to be able to engage in a way that is not necessarily possible, certainly not for independent voice teachers and probably not for academic teachers. So um, that is, that is, uh, yeah, so I'm here, just in there saying, hey, <laughs> just, let's just keep reminding ourselves of what is, you know, what is, what, <laughs> that there needs to be change, and let's see how we can make these changes happen, especially because we're continually asking, I mean, the institution wants to, and has some wonderful IDEA, that's the new terminology, and I, I can't remember the full, it used to be the old uh, DEA, and now uh, IDEA, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Access, I think, um, uh, especially because that is one of the stated goals of the institution and of institutions like it, so it's wonderful to have this as a stated goal and as, you know, to put together the committee to work through statements around IDEA and at the same time, um, these voices, um, uh-huh, Ian, yep, I, yep, <laughs> Ian saying we could start with holding conferences in cheaper cities and waiving registration. Yes, we could. <laughs> and... I mean, that also then comes into play. So then how does this start? How, who's, who's paying for that then? And how is this? I mean, there's a whole, I think, well, <laughs> Ian, you know, Michelle and I uh, talk quite a bit about this too, but, or have talked about this before too, where the, the shift, there's a whole shift that needs to happen in our, in our organizations where we're moving toward a better business model, right? And these organizations are like, I, you know, we were founded on, you know, access uh, th for all, but through this very specific channel that is no longer available. And also this very specific channel does not include diverse voices or necessarily independent voice teachers. You know, this very specific channel is the way that we were, th that this model started. And now, you know what, in order to make this thing equitable and in order to include the voices we want to include, that we say we want to include, um, I see a startup opportunity, yeah. In order to do that, then we've got to turn this into a better business model, right? We've got to actually get some, some business acumen happening here. And we're all voice teachers, not, most of us aren't like business people, <laughs> especially those of us in academia, right? Especially folks who are in academia, not necessarily working on a business model or understanding business. So that's also, so Michelle Mark Work devoe who is my business coach and who's, you know, uh, is also, working in the in, in in there too to just kind of like how do we make this organization the equitable accessible diverse organization that we want it to be or that we say we want it to be or do we just say you know what this is an academic institutions for people who can afford it <laughs> in this model who can afford this model <laughs>
and we just keep it that way. I mean, if you want to keep it that way, we can. Well, you do that too. You do whatever you want. But if we say that we want to have diverse voices, um, equity, then we also need to have you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do it in a new way, right? We gotta change the parameters. Okay, that was a whole other thing that I wasn't necessarily gonna get into, but then there we are. We're getting into it. So, <laughs> Gabby and Sarah and I put together a presentation on um, uh, classroom strategies for the independent voice teacher. And um, part of the reason that, that I wanted to work with both Sarah and Gabby on this is that Ga uh, Gabriella has, um, uh, she has her certification for teaching and education. Uh, Kristen says, part of the way we can do it is not be secretive about how we work and actually share knowledge. This is also an interesting, right? I mean, this is something we say we want to do. And, and this is also something that we think is part of the academic culture to share knowledge, but, but we only share knowledge within academia, right? We put it behind paywalls and we put it, yeah. So also, so, right, these are all really things that we've got to grapple with. These are all things that we need to kind of work hard to figure out and see how we can yeah so we uh so gabriella has a master's in education as well as an undergrad in education music education um and so as well as a ton of other certifications and uh, she is qualified to teach classroom as well as she also has an independent voice to uh, voice studio as well as she's a wonderful performer and sarah campbell uh, as well has a bunch of different um, certifications as well as having um as well as teaching at the college level she oversees a program that is actually a berkeley affiliate affiliate here in canada so um and then there's me and so we put together this presentation about the tenets of backward design, which is a, um, you know, a, uh, a planning model used in classroom education and with the application to independent voice studio teaching. And part of the reason that we put that together and one of the reasons I wanted to make, make that, you know, make those things clear is because so much of what we do in the independent voice studio, I mean, so like the vast majority of independent voice teachers and academic teachers, let's be honest, have no educational modeling background, right? We have no, we, we're teaching the way that we were taught and our teachers are teach, taught us the way that they were taught and it's the same in academia, you know? So many teachers do not have an understanding of like how to put together a syllabus, for example, or like what learning outcomes are, for example, and how to create a, uh, you know, a class with learning outcomes and, you know, so why? Because you can get, you can teach in university if you had a great career, <laughs> if you had a great singing career, then welcome to academia. I mean, I know it's not that way all over the place. But lots of voice teachers teaching in academia, you know, they're there because they had a terrific uh, singing career or some kind of singing career. And they've never actually had any, any formal training in, in how to teach an independent voice, like a one-on-one -on -one lesson, first of all, or how to teach classes, what, how to do an education, you know, no educational modeling um, or training in that way. So I wanted to put that together, and one of the things that uh, I wanted to, to do with that presentation, which I think we did, and which I hope I hope we did, is that is I wanted to make sure that we were being that we were being validating. No, I don't think that is true. Says Kate, we are creative and do better, and it's not that way. I have it's not you don't have to do both. Uh, I, I'm not quite understanding fully what you're saying there Kate um, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that that everyone is not teaching well that's not what I'm saying at all I'm just saying that the vast majority of academic teachers come into teaching with no training so they don't go to they don't go to teachers college they don't get a, a bachelor of education in music education they don't get an, a, a, an education masters etc so we the vast majority come in with no training so uh, and so this is part of the reason that we wanted to do this presentation in terms of independent voice teaching, uh, because so many folks have come to 
We do both, and we do it well and create ways of doing it. Well, lots of people do. Lots of people don't, though, okay? <laughs> lots of people don't do it well. <laughs> there are lots of folks out there who don't do it well. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Talk to people coming out of university. I mean, lots of folks don't do it well, and some do. And, and some do are creative. However, yes, there are lots of folks don't have, uh, the majority of folks don't have, um, you know, a formal education in, in how to create a class, for example, or how to teach well, I just don't. Um, so anyway, the main reason we want to do there, uh, yep, mentors are terrific and lots of study from the best in the business and great get great mentors, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is, I'm not saying that isn't the way that happens. I'm just saying we, the lots of folks come in and don't have any training whatsoever. So one of the reasons that we wanted to make this presentation is that we wanted, we wanted it to be a validation because here's what I'm saying. Uh, yes, mentorships can totally work to, to help us teach better, even at the university level, especially at the university level, I might say, Kristen, <laughs> especially, um, is that lots of voice teachers, uh, lots of voice teachers who I've worked with, as I'm, as I'm, when I'm in classes and making sort of learning strategies explicit, and when I'm talking about, when I'm trying to make, uh, you know, concepts explicit for voice teachers, the vast majority of them are saying, oh, this is so validating because this is what I figured out how to do on my own. I figured this out. And now you're telling me that this is actually like a thing, like there's research that shows that this is actually a thing. And oh, there's a reason that this works and there's a reason that I kind of landed here is because like I figured it out, you know, I read some books, I maybe took a couple of Shan's classes or I, you know, I, I worked with a mentor or I observed other people. And then now I'm here, I am teaching and I've been teaching for 15 years or something. And I wish I knew now what I knew when I started, but you know, don't we all? And like 15 years in or 20 years in, I'm listening to Shannon say that, these are the tenets of backward design and I'm going oh I already actually do a lot of this I already actually figured this out I didn't realize that this was actually a thing and now you're telling me that this is a real thing and this is actually researched and and my you know my educational colleagues learned it in school <laughs> so they came out of school you know not having to sort of discover it just having to implement it in their you know when in their teaching without having to you know they didn't actually have to discover it. meanwhile i'm over here like discovering it and then implementing it but i didn't realize that there was an actual model so that is the reason that we wanted to present that information and if you uh you know if you bought a ticket to the nets I think even if you're a Nets member you might be able to still see the replays i'm not sure how that works but you can take a look and see the replays will be up of all of the sessions, so you could go and take a look at that one or any of the other ones that you wanted to, if you wanted to. But where you'll see this, um, like what we did, which is this, we went through sort of systematically through what, what the tenets of backward design are. And then we said, and here are the ways that these can kind of be put into the studio. And here are some of the ways you're likely already doing it. And here are some ideas for a few other things to do. And also here are the resources so that you can get more information about what this looks like in the, what this looks like in the classroom. And then, you know, do some creative work to apply it in the studio. And also to be intentional about doing the things that you're already doing, right? To continue to do. Yes, uh, I wonder if teachers are were more willing to have other teachers into our studios and classes that would help to get feedback. Yeah, backward design is brilliant. Yeah, uh, Kirsten, another terrific question, right? Um, and this is, I mean, this kind of leads me into the voice pad undegree and why I'm working in the way that I'm working. Um, Allison says, most of my techniques were a compilation of what I was taught and saw and performed and mixed in the rest. It is so validating to hear what I've got right. Yes, I love the access to knowledge you help provide us to, uh, you're wonderful, to us teaching orphans to be part of the group has been so validating. I'm so glad. I'm so glad, Allison. Yeah. Yeah. But that is the reason that the work that I've been doing, especially over the pandemic, is sort of starting to coalesce, if you will, into the voice pet on degree is because I'm, you know, offering something for independent voice teachers who... You know, I had the opportunity to do a master's and do a doctorate in voice pedagogy. 
it was, um, well, they were performance degrees specializing in voice pedagogy. And for me, um, you know, there was certainly sacrifice involved there, but it was also super, like there was a lot of privilege there too, you know. I live within 45 minutes of a terrific program and university and teacher I wanted to work with. Um, and, you know, I, I had a, I have a, for my master's, my kids were three and five when I went back to school for my master's. And so my parents were able to be here while I was in school um, to kind of help support us uh, as we were, as you know, as, we're, as I was working on that. And then through the doctorate, uh, the kids were a little bit older and my partner, my, my husband is very, uh, has a flexible, excellent job. So we were able to, you know, we were able to do this work. I was able to do this work. So that is a lot of, you know, a lot of privilege to be able to do that. And also I'm in Canada where it doesn't cost as much. I'm sorry, but y'all in the States, that system is just deathly. It's just deadly. It's just, oh my gosh, it's so, so brutal. So it doesn't, it's not as uh, brutal to go to school here. So I, you know, you can get through it and not be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt or tens of thousands of dollars in debt by the end of it. Um, and also we have like some forgiveness programs and also, you know, like lots of things that help. <laughs> so for me, it was, I was able to do that, but the vast majority of independent voice teachers aren't able to do that. And it was useful for me, but I would say, you know, like fully two thirds weren't necessarily directly related to me being able to be an independent voice teacher. Uh, like two thirds probably of what I did. It was all good and I loved it all and I wanted it all, don't get me wrong. But probably two thirds of what I did in my in my graduate work was not specifically related to me being able to be a more successful, more um, um, effective voice teacher in an independent voice studio. So that's why Christine says in Australia, we only have one university with a vocal pedagogy course available. So we have many teachers who just don't even have access to music education or pedagogy. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad, Christine. Yeah, I'm so glad uh, it's been valuable to you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's, there's the access point as well, just in terms of, you know, if I want to get this degree or if I want to go back to school to get a, a you know, an academic certification in, in voice pedagogy, I have to, you know, and I don't live close to a good program or a program I want to do. I have to uproot my whole family or my business. I need to change everything about, you know, what I'm doing in my business in order to like get there, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention there is also access, you know, there are also access issues. I mean, this is changing with many universities now, or not many, but some universities are changing this around now too, but there's also access in terms of what the audition process is like you know, how, what kind of singing you have to, you know, what kind of singing and training you need in order to be able to audition successfully for a teaching program, you know, for like my, like I said, my degrees are performance degrees. So I had to do performance auditions um, to get in, in Western classical singing. And thankfully, thankfully, I mean, I was out of shape when I first, when I, when I went back, I was definitely out of shape. So thankfully um, they, I think, I mean, I worked hard on it. It's not like I wasn't, it's not like I went in there and didn't sing and sang, you know, poorly. And then they were like, yeah, come on in anyway. But I'm not, I'm not certain that I was at that time at the level um, singing that I maybe should have been in order to pass that audition well uh, with flying colors. But uh, I think everything else in my package was quite <laughs> made up for perhaps I wasn't quite at the, you know, the A level in terms of my, and I certainly got to that level in during the degree. But um, yeah, so there's also barriers that way too, you know, in terms of, in many schools still, in terms of being able to just simply audition and, and pass the audition in styles that are that perhaps you haven't sung in a, in a long time or that you never trained in in the first place, you know. So uh, that is changing too. But again, that's why the, the VPUD is here. <laughs> that's why I'm doing the, the voice VPUD degree. So, you know, this is like two semesters of training um, 
Yes, yeah, exactly, Allison says. And we teach students wanting to sing in so many styles that the classical only model doesn't really prepare you for. Absolutely. Well, that's the thing, you know. Uh, um, again, I think these programs are changing and moving forward. And at the same time, in order to give, in order for an institution to give a certification, there has to be assessment protocols, and those assessments are under, you know, an institutional banner, and so in an institutional model. And so sometimes the things that that the institution values in terms of an assessment parameter are not necessarily things that are actually assessing what you need to know for a voice studio, right? Or how to teach well. They're not actually assessing whether you teach well, they're assessing whether you understand material. And understanding material is fine, but that understanding material doesn't mean you're gonna be able to teach well. That <laughs> It might inform your teaching, but you know, those, those assessment standards are different. And the other thing about the academic institution and, and um, you know, uh, Nats has come out with a toward a common curriculum for teaching voice pedagogy um, in, in academic institutions, and, um, which, you know, I was involved with in, in terms of summits and, and being, you know, in the game in a few ways that way. But um, they've come up with a, a, a kind of common curriculum suggestion and resources, which I think is fantastic so that we don't have, you know, uh, teachers out there teaching whatever they want for voice ped and like, you know, they've, they've kind of decided that, uh, I don't know, whoever's thing is the best thing and so now you get to learn that. So, you know, it's nice to have those resources and to have everything kind of in one place in terms of a, a, a suggested curriculum which is terrific, especially for folks who, who never had any training in how to set up a class uh, with learning objectives, for example. So they've got, they've got syllabi with um, uh, suggested learning objectives, et cetera, and sort of how to set up a class. So that's all terrific. And, and suggested assessment protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So just terrific. And by the same token, there are you know, the vast majority of undergraduate voice ped students are going to go on to teach independent voice studios, especially, you know, close to when they've taken that class. So they're, or they're going to be teaching in music schools, you know, so they're not, they're, they're going to be teaching a specific kind of, well, all the students, right? Except for the 18 to 24 year olds who are learning Western classical singing. So they're going to be teaching everybody else. So we've got academic voice teachers who are sort of deciding what independent voice teachers need to know, right? So there's a little bit of a disjoint there as well, disconnect there as well. And, you know, I'm not really speaking out of turn here. This is feedback that I am <laughs> continually giving and that I will be giving in formal written <laughs> soon. Um, but... Uh, so we've got, um, you know, they did a survey through uh, and asked academic voice teachers who are teaching voice pedagogy in undergraduate voice ped classes, what are you teaching? What do you think is important? What do they need to know? You know, what, what texts are you using? What examples? What do your syllabi look like, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is fantastic. They gathered in a lot of data and put together a lot of, like it's a really, you know, it's a fantastic initiative. And at the same time, we're still asking independent. We're still asking academic voice teachers what they think independent voice teachers need to know. <laughs> so we're still asking academic voice teachers who have maybe never taught a six-year-old in their lives <laughs> what they think the people who are teaching six-year-olds need to know. <laughs> I mean, okay, but maybe, maybe let's ask the independent voice teachers what they want to know <laughs> and what they, what they wish they had had more of in their undergrad voice ped class if they, if they took one, right? Let's maybe ask the independent voice teachers. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure they're the ones who know <laughs> what they want and <laughs> what they need to know, right? They're actually doing it, so maybe let's ask them. So that's, again, that's another, re uh, yeah, teach musicianship, sure. Uh, phrasing, sure. I mean, those are all things, but like, maybe we should ask independent voice teachers what they want rather than um, uh, having, you know. Um, Kirsten says, have you heard of Dr. Jeffrey Bohr's rubric for choral singing, University of Washington? Uh, oh, that's, that's interesting. Does assume uh, beginning to advanced uh, singing abilities. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. So 
Uh, Kirsten, I will. Uh, I'll take a look at that. Thank you for suggesting that. I, I haven't. I haven't heard of it, as far as I know. Anyway, I mean, I have a list of, uh, you know, a mile long of all of the things that I want to look into. So, <laughs> I will take a look. Um, yeah, Kate, for sure. I mean, reading it, it, reading to a certain extent is important for sure. Uh, possibly not necessarily for all students in an independent voice studio. Not necessarily. They have to be musicians, do they? <laughs> uh, I get your kids when they audition and it is the difference between a scholarship and not. I mean, sure, yes, but the vast majority of independent voice teachers are not working with students who, singers who want to audition for schools. The, I mean, the vast majority of your typical independent voice studio uh, teachers, the vast majority of a typical independent voice studio, so some are in the suburbs or somewhere, you know, uh, out in wherever, they're, the makeup of the studio is, you know, maybe 25% of, um, maybe 25% of the, the, the people that they're working with want to go on to do music as uh, you know as a career or audition for a school so the other 75 percent uh if they want to be an artist sure but uh, they need to play an instrument sure and they need to be a professional singer they need to be able to read to be a professional singer backup singer yeah sure but i'm this is what i'm saying kate like those are very specific students and your assumption about what uh it doesn't matter train then it works the brain sure but your assumption about what people need is based on what you think those students or what what teachers need to teach is based on what you think the students want to do and i'm telling you that it's a, a, a it is a minority of students in independent voice studios who want to go on to be a professional musician the majority are are taking voice lessons because they want to maybe audition for the school choir, who are taking voice lessons because they maybe want to sing one song at their wife at their wedding. They're taking voice lessons. I did ask about academia. I was talking about academia at first, for sure, for sure. But I'm just saying now, like in terms of what are we teaching in voice ped classes? We're teaching. Uh, we're teaching folks. Uh, who are not, uh, we're, the, the folks who are in voice ped classes are 99%, vast majority, they're going to go teach an independent t uh, studio, right? They're going to go teach an independent studio. What do we see in an independent studio? Yeah, I agree, Daniel. I, I, obviously, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging the unique um, and valuable experience that we independent voice uh, teachers have. Of course, university teachers have wonderful and valuable experience. Of, of course, absolutely. Independent teacher is a very different animal. Ian says, I think there's an intersection of two issues raised here. Anyone who doesn't participate in a service association like NATS because of the perception that it shouldn't cost money by definition won't be involved in the in initiatives of the association. I know independent teachers invited to participate in the PED curriculum initiative who wouldn't participate, so we get what we're willing to commit to. Uh, yes, I agree. Yeah, so Ian, I, I agree, and uh, there are uh, what we're willing to commit to, but again, uh, so, you know, I, I was at the summits um, myself, and I also was invited to write and to be on some of the writing, you know, some of the writing um, committees. Um, and, you know, I was invited to be, uh, and agreed to initially to be on the first writing committee with Amelia and um, Catherine, was it Catherine? My brain's gone. Uh, to be on that first initial, you know, gathering of the information and, and uh, that initial writing committee. And I simply could not. Um, my commitments at the time, my family commitments, uh, meant that if I wanted to be able to, uh, you know, continue to participate in this way, I, I just, I simply couldn't. I would have to teach less somehow, so make less money, or sleep less somehow, <laughs> or I mean, I just simply couldn't. So the, and again, that kind of comes back to. That, I think that comes back to the structure of an independent studio as well, you know, like I'm not taking the summers off necessarily unless I, you know, unless I do some planning for it. I'm not necessarily, you know, able to take a chunk of time to devote to a specific thing. 
Um, and I know it's not necessarily the same. And I, I know I know academia. There's a there's uh, yes, there are some the same kinds of barriers. Um, but I don't think it's fair to say that independent teachers. Uh, I think it needs to be easier for independent teachers to be able to participate. I think it just needs to be easier. And one way that it would have been easier, uh, actually, is if we had done. Why didn't we do a? Why didn't we do the same kind of um, uh, survey of independent teachers that we did of the academic teachers, right? So we did that academic teacher survey of all of the academic teachers. What are you teaching? What's your syllabi, et cetera, et cetera. We could have done uh, the same kind of survey of independent voice teachers. And I think it just has to be easier. I think it has to it, it has to mean more. I don't my you know it has to I, I I can't take things off the off my plate you know the same way. Um, I think it's a little bit unfair that we get what we're willing to commit to. I think that's a little bit unfair. I, although I hear you, I hear you, but I think it needs to be easier. Liz said it would be so cool if ped practice involved students from indie studios. Yeah, kiddo and adult beginners. We, uh, I know some programs do do that, Liz, I'll just say that. Um, and I know, so the graduate program at the University of Toronto, which is the one that I know the best, obviously, um, the graduate program, those students who are in that, who are doing teaching practicums in that program are teaching, uh, they're teaching um, uh, other voice types than themselves. They're teaching other, they're doing group lessons. Uh, they are teaching children in many cases and they're teaching adult beginners, yes, and they're teaching aging voices. So, so uh, Lorna McDonald at the University of Toronto, um, you know, has definitely sees <laughs> that this, that independent voice teachers, these folks who are there, they need to get some experience teaching folks that they would, you know, that they're not necessarily going to uh, get experience teaching otherwise and so she is very intentional about making sure that those kinds of learners are included in the curriculum in terms of the practicum and that is what that is why i'm doing the vpod right so that we've got those kinds of learners so that we're teaching those kinds of learners in the practicum that's that's what's happening in the practicum and the practicum or sorry the for the voice pet degree and the voice pet degree is geared toward teachers at some point i'm going to include a like so you've never taught before section and that's going to be like you know, you do this first and then you do the VPUD. Um, but that is, it is geared toward teachers, independent voice teachers in particular, who have a studio already. So who have students already, so that we are teaching each other as well as each other's students, as well as working with those very, like we're, we're actually going to be working with the students, we're gonna be applying in real life with real life students, with actual typical independent voice students that we'll see. Um, and it says, my own experience as an indie voice teacher is that often the lesson isn't even about performance at all. The lesson is the thing. Absolutely, Daniel. I, I agree 100%. In many cases, the performance is really very secondary. And the performance, in many cases, is just the goal that gets you that, well, this is backward design, isn't it, right? The performance becomes the thing that we're working toward, but all the things that I learned on the way to being able to execute this performance are actually the learning objectives. Those are actually all the things that we're learning um, and all the lessons on the way too. I have what I'll call a holistic approach where I respect and work with their goals, but find a blend of bit of everything because it will sometimes open up paths and music they didn't know existed. I have had quite a number change from pop divas to going to university for classical and it's become their favorite thing. Oh, I, Alison, absolutely, I think, uh, well, and I think you've heard me say this before, I think it is a responsibility of an independent voice teacher with younger students, especially who don't necessarily know what they want yet. Um, some of them do, but who don't necessarily know what they want. I think it is our responsibility in the studio to expose them to things that they would not have been exposed to had they not taken voice lessons, right? Had they not come into the studio. I think it is our responsibility not to impose, but to offer options. And sometimes that the option, I mean, my experience was that there was only one option, right? There were, there were no options. I had no choices. The choice was that you could sing classical or not. <laughs> and you could sing some Disney, you know, you could sing some Disney songs if you wanted to. But you had to do it in the classical style, not in the pop style. 
Um, so those were those were the, I didn't have any options, um, and so many of us, you know, who took lessons in that era didn't have options. And now I think the options are becoming more and more available. And also, like I said, the, the, I think it is our responsibility as independent voice teachers to offer options and to expose, right? Um, I teach both. And I think the weakness in private studios is that they can't even count in tune. Band are prepared. Um, sure, Kate. I'll, I'll say that, that is, that's, that's your experience, and I'm not sure that that's fair to say overall voice studios. I just, I, in fact, I know that's not fair to say overall voice studios. And that's been your experience, and that's fair, but um, uh, it needs to be easier. Ian says, all of us get what we're willing to commit to, not just one affinity group. I have to be back. I had to back out of a ton of stuff this year for family reasons. I see holes in the pet initiatives that I could have helped to shape. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Ian. I, you know, I think I think where I'm where I'm my back is up a little bit is like all of us get what we're willing to commit to, but I also think that it's easier for some folks, right? I mean, this comes back to privilege and comes back to who who is able to do things and who and who do we perceive as being able to do things, but then are are they actually able like what are the what are the barriers for folks to actually be able to you know be willing to commit to something i think that's that's where my that's where my my objection is i think ian is that i don't i don't disagree uh that we that we that uh there is certainly a willingness to commit uh that there is a you know there's a back and forth there i don't disagree to, with that at all i just think that there is um a uh we're not all able for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah, Ian, most academic jobs pay terribly, yeah. <laughs> well, in the States, <laughs> in the States. I'd make a lot more money on the private market. Yeah, it's possible, it's possible. <laughs> so you're making that choice, right, for yourself. You're making that choice and that's all good and you know, it is what it is. And uh, at the same time, the, the, the ability to what I can give and what, you know, like there, I mean, there are barriers for lots of folks to be able to make the commitment. And also, uh, part of the reason that, part of the reason that my contribution in some ways um, to uh, organizations like Nats and uh, is, is uh, part of that, part of the reason that my contribution is valued, if you will, is because I have the academic credentials, right? So I have the academic credentials. I can write in an academic style. Um, you know, I have like, I have all the, you know, I teach uh, at an academic institution. So I teach a class. Like, so, uh, so there's a lot of sort of um, the reason that I am able to, uh, that I'm invited to some things. And the reason that I have, you know, is because I have some of those some of those credentials, and also because I have the ability to do some of the stuff that uh, that someone else would need mentoring to be able to do, and that's fine. But we need to recognize if we want the voices of you know other independent voice teachers, for example, who don't have the academic credentials and who aren't comfortable writing academically, for example, just as an example, but who aren't necessarily comfortable writing academically, then we need to maybe put in some mentorship programs for folks to be able to be comfortable writing academically, if that's what we want, you know? I think, I think we just don't always recognize what the barriers are. <laughs> or we take the barriers down without actually, you know, we take, we take down the gates, but we don't actually offer people any, you know, we don't change the system. So still the same people who are able to get through, it's just that we're able to get through easier because the gates are down, you know? Um, and the people who weren't able to get through because of the gates before still can't get through because we still they still don't have the map. <laughs> wow, there's an analogy for you. <laughs> so we still need to get, you know we still need to create. There still needs to be some systemic changes. Ooh, yeah, this is all. Yeah, colloquial. Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, Kirsten. I'm not. I'm not saying that everything needs to be academic. I'm. I'm just saying as an example. You know, when we're talking about, for example, when we're talking about the Journal of Singing, where we're talking, which is the the Nats uh, Journal, 
where we're talking about we want more voices, you know, in that journal. But lots of folks aren't comfortable writing in that voice, right, in that more academic style, um, which is fine. So we need to just figure out: do we, if we want more voices, do we create a more colloquial? Do we, uh, do we, uh, you know, edit for a more colloquial style in some in some of these articles and columns? Or do we mentor, oh yeah, yeah, exactly, Kirsten. Or do we mentor folks to be able to have a more academic writing style? So then we still get those voices, but they aren't, you know, they're not barred from being able to submit and write uh, and contribute because we've said that we want this journal to have an academic voice or an academic style. So that is, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the that's the crux of it, you know. Like, we absolutely colloquial is also good, absolutely. <laughs> but if we're if we're talking about the journal of singing, for example, then what do we what 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 do we want? If we say we want more independent voice teachers, well, lots of independent voice teachers are not comfortable writing in academic styles. I mean, lots of academic folks aren't comfortable writing academic styles either. But it is more expected. They've done it generally done it more often, right? Okay. I think that's all the things. All I'm saying is, hey, the voice pet undegree, I'm doing it for independent voice teachers. I am an independent voice teacher. Uh, so I, um, you know, I, I think I have a pretty good understanding. I've taught all the same folks you have, you know. Um, so I have a pretty good understanding of what, uh, what, what is in there. And also because, uh, because I want it to be, we're going to co-create assessments. We're going to, you know, the lectures are all delivered it, not in real time. You can watch all the lectures all li online and then our classes, and I know there are some programs, um, Nick Perna and Joshua Glass Glasner and uh, Yvonne uh, Gonzalez Redman. Gosh, Yvonne, do I have your last name right? I'm not sure. Anyway, they presented at, the, at Nats on sort of a different model of VoicePed and a different model of class where the class is sort of turned around in, you know, where the lecture is not is not delivered real time. Everybody is responsible to get the, the materials themselves, get the information themselves, and then the discussion is the class. So you do a lab essentially for your class, uh, which that is basically what we are doing in, in the VPUD. So we'll have lab discussion and then practicum. Yeah, can't wait. Okay, all of that. That's almost an hour of me talking some voice pen odds and ends <laughs> in a little bit of a gathering up of the conference. Um, Redmond, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, hi, Yvonne, I didn't know you were watching. So there we go, I'm glad I got it right. <laughs> uh, which, right, that's awesome. Yeah, lab is amazing. Uh, in middle school in the US, oh, that's so great. Kristen, I'm so glad that you were able to, to watch, yeah. Um, live anyway. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. And like I said, there, this this kind of work is certainly being done in in our academic classrooms in some spaces for sure. And at the same time, if you're an independent voice teacher and you want to get some certification, uh, that is going to cost you a little less. And is going to be. Uh, I I say it's an academic model. Oh, thank you, Yvonne. Same, same. Yeah. <laughs> same, same, same. Um, so I say it's an academic model that gives you all the things academia can't yet. I might, I, I, maybe I should put yet in brackets <laughs> for that because there are some, there are some things coming up in academia. So academic model gives you all the things that academia can't. Take good care, friends. I hope you have a terrific weekend. I thought like all day that today was Monday. <laughs> And it's not. It's Friday. Who gets Monday and Friday mixed up? Huh? I would blame it on jet lag, but like Chicago's only one hour behind. It's not like it's not like I've like it's not like I anyway. There you go. Who gets that mixed up? Take care. Have a terrific day and weekend. Happy happy weekend.